guys. Today we are talking about understanding 3.5.4 and um, the topic of genetically modified organisms or GMOs. So I'd like you to please pause the video, read that understanding, and then think about what you've heard in the media regarding GMOs. The first thing that's important to keep in mind when we discuss uh, genetically modified organisms is the universality of the genetic code. Um, the genetic code is the same for all known organisms, therefore um, base codes for the same amino acids turn into the same proteins universally. Um, this makes it in some ways quite easy to take genes from one organism and to insert them into another organism because the outcome of that particular gene at least protein wise is known of course the effect of that protein within the organism may not be known and has to be studied more um, but the genetic code itself is you know fairly simple to understand and has predictable outcomes one thing to keep in mind when we talk about this is an ethical and moral question, which is whether or not it is right to change the genetic integrity of a species by transferring genes to it from another species. Um, so be keeping that in mind and also think about what are some possible consequences of such technology, whether positive or negative. Okay, so let's talk about the actual action of gene transfer. Um, gene transfer uses a vector of some kind. A vector is an agent that transports between one organism and another, um, usually carrying genetic information. Um, in, in genetic engineering specifically, it is carrying DNA um, and and this DNA is uh, basically carrying a DNA fragment of a particular desired gene that can be inserted within the vector. Um, we are going to be doing a style of this using E. coli. And E. coli are great to work with because we're able to use a plasmid vector. Remember, plasmids are small circular sections of DNA that carry approximately 12 genes. And so a plasmid is an ideal place to insert the desired gene and ensure that it enters the um, new cell and is expressed. Another benefit of using plasmids is that they replicate independently of the chromosomes and can also be copied many, many times via natural cloning and then potentially be passed um, from one bacterial cell to another. Okay, so let's go through the actual process. Um, restriction enzymes are used to cut out the desired gene from DNA separated by gel electrophoresis. We talked about restriction enzymes a little bit yesterday uh, during DNA profiling. Um, so those restriction enzymes are going to be used to cut the DNA in a specific spot selecting for a specific gene. Um, this exposes what's known as the sticky ends of the genes. Um, and the sticky end is basically uh, just an area where other DNA can be bonded to it so it can be inserted into that vector. Okay. Number two, the plasmids uh, isolated from the bacterial cells are cut with the same restriction enzyme, leaving complementary sticky ends. So now this gene and this plasmid are able to combine. The open plasmid and gene containing fragments will then be combined by a second enzyme called DNA ligase. The recombinant DNA is then introduced into the host cell where it will be expressed and the cell will be transformed. Um, transform again through the production of whatever protein that gene codes for. Transformed bacteria will then reproduce asexually, creating many generations of the modified cell and causing that um, recombinant DNA to be passed from generation to generation. We are going to be doing an example of this, like I said, 
with bacterial cells using a um, recombinant plasmid. Okay, so let's talk about some successful examples of genetically modified organisms. Um, in animals, it's important to keep in mind that eukaryotes do not have plasmids, therefore gene transfers are more difficult, um, and they have to occur in the nucleus, um, and then genes will be copied and passed by mitosis. And of course, if we want to have a generation of genetically modified organisms, then that passing um, must occur in egg or sperm cells um, to be passed on to those second generation organisms. So. Uh, GMOs in eukaryotic cells is a little bit more complicated. However, there has been some success. So one example is transgenic sheep. Transgenic sheep have been used to make um, expensive medical proteins in their milk. Um, one example of this is a protein, um, a protein required for maintaining lung elasticity. And so this is a protein called AAT, and there are people who, who have a deficiency of this protein. Um, so in this idea came up because artificial manufacturing of AAT was pretty unsuccessful, um, but sheep were able to be um, modified so that their mammary gland would produce the AAT and it would be produced in the milk and then can be isolated from there to use in medicine. So one really interesting use for GMOs. Another um, that we hear about more often are transgenic plants. Um, there are many, many transgenic plants already in large production in the U.S. and around the world. These plants include cotton, tobacco, oilseed, maize, potatoes, soya, and tomatoes. Um, some of the variations that we see with these, many of them are herbicide resistant, um, allowing them to be sprayed with things like Roundup, which will affect the weeds but not affect the crop itself. Um, there are some rice varieties that contain, you know, different vitamins or proteins such as beta carotene. Um, there are the changes in tomatoes that allow them to ripen on the plant but not to rot as quickly. Um, so that's going to be some kind of reduction in the ethylene hormone within the tomato. And then there are also plants that are resistant to insects or insecticides. Um, so all of these things have either made the plant potentially more desirable as a food source um, or made it so that the plant can grow under, you know, any condition without being harmed. So pretty interesting and definitely will have an impact on the overall availability of these crops in the future. However, it's important to think about what are the impacts of these things. So there are a lot of concerns associated with genetically modified organisms, um, for example, will a gene be added to a genome and function in an unforeseen manner? Might an introduced gene for resistance to adverse conditions get transferred to a weed species or a predator? Is it possible for such harmless or organisms such as E. coli uh, to be transformed into harmful pathogens that could then cause epidemic in a population? And then again, back to that question, is there an overriding principle that humans should not change nature, that we should, that it's morally or ethically incorrect to um, tamper with genetic material? So these are just a few questions to start you off. Uh, what I'd like you to do to end this video is to read pages 128 and 129. And I'd like you to discuss the risk factors um, for a particular example. And in this example, you're looking at a herbicide-tolerant plant. And so I'd like you to list the benefits of herbicide-tolerant plants as well as the dangers. Um, I'll be asking about those benefits and dangers when you return to class. Thanks for listening. Have a great day.